Hello everybody and welcome back to the Bones 5 YouTube channel on YouTube. In this video we're going to be covering the AI of all the different sections of FNAF 6's gameplay along with its hardest challenge, the Hardest Saturday. Also make sure to stick around to the end to see the The Bones 5 official approved Hardest FNAF game tier list. Before we jump straight into the basic mechanics of FNAF 6, I want to quickly showcase some of the amazing The Bones 5 fan art that I've seen. If you would like to submit fan art or just talk to me and my community, I now have a Discord server that you can join through the link in the description or in the pinned comment. With that out of the way, let's get into the mechanics of my favorite FNAF game, Five Nights at Freddy's Pizzeria Simulator. FNAF 6 was released as somewhat of a prank by Scott, with the community thinking it was just another joke game like the FNAF 3 hoax from years prior, but it shocked the community as a full-on sequel to Sister Location. <coughs> Though the title of Pizzeria Simulator wouldn't be a complete lie. FNAF 6 has three different sections of gameplay. The Pizzeria Simulator section, where you can build and manage your own pizzeria with the goal of becoming as successful as possible, then two other sections of gameplay that follow a much more FNAF and horror-like format. The first of these are the more traditional office sections. This is where most of the game takes place and will involve you fending off animatronics using various tools and your flashlight. This office section is much different from the other FNAF games, however, as there is a clear absence of a fixed night time. The time that you spend in the office is instead based on the different tasks that you must complete. Upon completing all of your assigned tasks, you are able to log off and advance to the final of the three main gameplay sections, salvages. Complete the maintenance checklist he looked tough as shit. He looked tough as before. shit, I cannot even you lie. Yeah. Salvages allow you to get some extra cash by salvaging one of the four main animatronics for parts within your pizzeria. These salvages are how you will usually increase the difficulty of the game, as upon completing a salvage, the animatronic that you salvage will now try to kill you during office sections. There is a ton of variability and player choice within these three gameplay sections, and depending on your personal choices, the end of your playthrough will net you one of six different endings. Now that we've covered the basic structure of FNAF 6, let's get into the AI of where you'll be spending most of your time, the office sections. The office sections in FNAF 6 are some of the scariest in the whole series, but when you break them down to the AI and fundamentals behind the gameplay, they actually end up as one of the easier nights in the series as a whole. Easier than I thought it would be. He got my ass hard. The entire challenge of the night is similar to FNAF 3, where you have to locate where the animatronics are in order to prevent them from reaching and then attacking you. There are four animatronics in total. Molten Freddy, Scrap Trap, Scrap Baby, and Lefty. Unlike the other FNAF games, all four of these animatronics behave nearly identically. They always have a one-third chance to move on any given movement opportunity, and this AI value for their movement never changes throughout the entire game, but the time between movement opportunities, or their interval, does. On Monday, they'll have a movement opportunity every 8 seconds, every 5 seconds on Tuesday, every 4 seconds on Wednesday, every 3 seconds on Thursday, every 2.5 seconds on Friday, and every 2 seconds on Saturday. Their movement patterns also never change throughout the entire game. They can move anywhere in the building, but are more likely to move towards the player than away from the player. The only aspect that is unique to each animatronic is their teleportation mechanics. Like Bonnie and FNAF 1, Molten Freddy, Scrap Trap, and Scrap Baby can all teleport directly next to your office assuming certain conditions are met. If 10 seconds have passed in the night and Molten Freddy enters the top center room, he will teleport directly to the room outside of your left vent. This same mechanic applies to Scrap Trap and Scrap Baby, instead of requiring 20 seconds to pass and teleporting them to your right vent. This mechanic is why a lot of the Let's Players ended up dying on Night 2 when the game first came out. Luckily, by a miracle programming error, Lefty cannot teleport, which relaxes the game just a bit. 
now that we know how the animatronics can move, how can you defend yourself against them? Aside from doing tasks, your computer can be used for three different tools that can help you throughout the night, though we'll only end up using one of them in the actual strategy. Starting off with the motion detector, the motion detector is quite simple. It'll produce a clicking sound whenever an animatronic has moved or whenever it's first turned on. and display the positions of all the animatronics. The audio lure also displays the locations of animatronics whenever it's active, though only if they're located within its circular range. It has a 50% chance to drag any animatronics from adjacent vents to wherever it's located. Out of all of the tools, it's the least useful. The audio lure has a pretty limited range and doesn't guarantee that animatronics will be fooled by it. Unlike the audio lure, our next tool, Silent Ventilation, is by far the best of the bunch. Silent Ventilation is the only tool in the game that can remain active while the terminal is off. This comes in handy when trying to make as little noise as possible while also not overheating the office. These terminal-based tools may be good in certain situations, but by far the most useful tools you'll have are your headphones or speakers, I don't know what kind of what kind of setup you have, and your flashlight. The days of the garbage FNAF 2 flashlight are gone, as this flashlight will stop any animatronic in their tracks as long as you're facing their direction. However, knowing which direction to face is crucial. Whenever an animatronic enters the vent next to you or the adjacent room, one of six different vent sounds will play. I'll play some examples now. This sound will pan to whatever side the animatronic is on, and will be quiet if they've entered the adjacent room, and a bit louder if they've entered the closer vent. This panning will change depending on where you're facing. If you're facing the vent that it came from, you'll hear it in both ears. But if the animatronic is making the sound in the vent behind you, you'll hear it in the ear opposite the vent that you're facing. In addition to these vent sounds, Molten Freddy, Scrap Trap, and Scrap Baby will also play voice lines upon entering an adjacent room after one minute into the night. I heard your call. You may not recognize me at first, but I assure you, it's still me. These voice lines don't pan, so it doesn't indicate where they are in the vents, but it at least lets you know that they're close. Lefty is, once again, left out and has no voice lines. Bruh! <laughs> You're not even mature yet! You always speak! Ooh. You cry like a b <laughs> Get a f***ing kill, crap ass! Are, are you on drugs? Your mama on drugs! Get your ass out, dumb ass! Weak ass! <laughs> These sound cues are very important to recognize. If you happen to be facing the opposite direction or the center of the room when an animatronic is in an opposite vent, the animatronic will advance into your office and jump scare you if they're able to hear you. Ooh. Dude. Oh. My birthday. Did you have a gift for me? I had a, I had a gift for you. <laughs> what determines if the animatronics can hear you is a percent chance that the game checks every time a movement opportunity occurs. The amount of utilities that you have on in your office will increase this percent chance. By default, you always have a 10% chance of being heard. The fan and terminal each add a 20% chance to this counter when powering up or shutting down, and add 40% when fully active. Any noises that are generated from doing tasks, such as the printing noise on an advertising task or the whirring sound on the supply tasks, will each add 20%. If you decide to accept any sponsorships, the ad appearing on your terminal will add 20% as well. Whether or not animatronics can hear you is extremely important, as it, well, prevents you from dying, but also determines how much time you'll have between subsequent animatronic attacks, which is really important when trying to clutch out those longer advertising tasks. If an animatronic can hear you, but the flashlight is on them, they'll retreat back to the bottom corner room on 4 second intervals. While this prevents you from immediately dying, it won't be long before that animatronic is right back at your vent. In fact, with bad enough luck, they could come back in 4 seconds on a Saturday. However, when both your terminal and fan are off, your flashlight somehow gains brightness and is able to shine into the vent 
and the adjacent room. It also gains the ability to send animatronics the whole way back to the top corner of the building, giving you far more time to complete tasks. It's also worth noting that if you aren't facing an animatronic, but they don't hear you in the vents, they'll move back to one of the center rooms. The last thing to cover within the office sections is the only other threat in the game besides the animatronics, and that is the new temperature mechanic. By default, the temperature has a 50% chance to increase by 1 degree every second, and this is perfectly countered by the silent ventilation tool, as when it's active, it has a 50% chance to decrease the temperature by 1 degree every second, so long as the temperature is above 70 degrees. Turning on the terminal doubles the rate of heating in the office, now having a 50% chance to increase the temperature by 1 every half second. Turning on the fan will change the temperature decrease rate to every 0.4 seconds if the computer is off, and every 0.5 seconds if the computer is on. Here is a table that it's taken made of the average temperature change values depending on what systems you have on. The temperature will not do anything gameplay-wise until you reach 120 degrees, in which you will just black out and lose the night. The temperature creates a unique problem in which you have to balance out the temperature of the room with how much sound you make in order to fend off animatronics, and we'll get more into how to combat this in the strategy section. The last thing to cover in the office sections is how the ad system works. You can accept up to 5 sponsorships throughout the pizzeria section of gameplay. These will award you with a decent sum of money, but can make the nights harder when an ad for the sponsored company appears on the terminal. Each ad has a 25% chance of being queued every 20 seconds. The next time you look at the monitor, the ad will appear. adding 20% to your noise risk and locking you in place till the ad is finished. That's, that sucks. Uh, ads can also interrupt tasks if you have one active and happen to get an ad in the middle of completing it. Luckily, ads are able to overlap and won't appear for the rest of the night once they've already been activated. If two ads are queued at once, they will both display at the same time, knocking out two ads in one five second period. Now that you know how the office section works, the community proposed the hardest challenge in this game as the hardest Saturday, which is Saturday with all salvages, all ads, no upgrades, and no tools. This is by far the hardest challenge that you can do in this game, and stay tuned for the breakdown of that challenge. But for now, we still have two different types of gameplay to cover. Once you finish the office sections on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, you'll be given the option to salvage an animatronic at the end of the night, awarding you cash if you win the salvage. The basic premise of the salvages is to progress through the audio prompts and watch the animatronic for movement. If the animatronic gets too aggressive, you can use a taser to reset the animatronic. However, you can only use this taser three times before damaging the animatronic and decreasing the amount of revenue you gain from the salvage. Salvages are essentially one big progress bar made up of 1,200 units. This progress bar will start randomly at 0 or 100. Once the progress bar reaches 1,000, you will die the next time that you flip up the page. If it reaches 1,200, you will die no matter what. The audio prompt is the means of progression for the salvage. So every 10 seconds that the audio prompt is playing, there's a 50% chance for 150 plus 50 times the night number to be added to the progress bar. There are five audio prompts in total that are all varying lengths though these lengths are consistent throughout all four of the salvages. In order to progress to the next audio prompt, you will be required to document results, but you don't actually need to check any of the boxes, just quickly flip up the page. This is done to trigger movement and jump scares in the animatronics, similar to how FNAF 1's cameras worked. You shouldn't hold the page up for long, as every second that you look at the page, the aggression of the animatronic will increase by 10 plus 10 times the night number progress. There is also a 50% chance to raise the aggression value to 750 at the start of the fourth audio prompt on every single night. So, knowing all of this, what is the optimal strategy for these salvage sections? When I was researching for this video, I considered making a stopwatch strategy that would eliminate the need for any skill whatsoever, but it ended up being a lot more complicated than just playing the way the game intended, so we're just gonna do that. You're going to be looking for two tells throughout the salvage to know if you should shock an animatronic or not. These tells are the movement stages of the animatronic and their respective sound cues. Every animatronic has three movement stages. If you spot any of them in their third stage, you know that their aggression is now past 750. If you see them here, use your taser to shock them and reset their progress to a random value between 0 and 300. Each animatronic has a distinct visual cue when in their third stage. Molten Freddy will have a much larger shadow on the table. Scrap Chat will be showing his teeth on your bottom left corner. Scrap Baby will have visible eyes. 
and lefty star will only have a bit of light shining on its right corner. I'd recommend flipping up the page every 10 seconds in order to catch any movement, as you don't want to go too far into a tape without flipping the page and die without knowing what stage the animatronic is in. However, if you're uncertain about whether or not you should flip the page up, there is an additional tell that you can look out for to make sure it's safe. Each animatronic has a sound cue that indicates when they're getting more aggressive, first becoming audible at 750 progress and then louder at 900 progress. These audio cues match the progress of the phase changes, so I'd recommend pausing the tape and listening for any of the animatronic sounds before flipping up the page. If you hear any, you should shock the animatronic. I'll play all the different sound cues now. With these strategies, you should very easily win every single salvage, but note that the salvages, particularly Baby and Lefty, can sometimes give you luck that is impossible to beat without reducing their value to half. But if you die, you get nothing. If I die, I get no racks. I get no no bands, no motion. Sure, I'm recording the motion man, bitch. Oh my god. So it's usually better to take what you can get and play it safe. If you want to risk it, you could in theory wait an extra 10 seconds on every third phase or audio cue before shocking, but this assumes that you catch every movement immediately as it happens. Also, if you want, you can just skip any salvage section by holding Ctrl S. This is similar to the cheat codes in the early games of the CD+. Now that's two out of the three main gameplay portions down, and it's now time to cover the actual simulator section of Pizzeria Simulator. I'm going to be honest, there isn't that much interesting AI to cover in this section and much less any that is useful. So instead, I'll be going over how to easily get all of the six different endings within the simulator section. Something that's going to be extremely important for a few of these is how to cash farm. So here's a quick guide on cash farming. We're first going to be obtaining cash through increasing our FAS rating, then using the insane cash bonuses from the achievement system. This is your first time playing the game, make sure to customize your pizza with the bottom four options, as it will net you an extra $100 to start out. To start, buy the small show stage and all of the trash in the gang animatronic. Place each of them down individually on the show stage to work out some cash, then buy the sanitation station. This will decrease our risk for the remainder of the playthrough, but also put our total money spent above $100 the required amount to unlock the Stan's Budget Tech catalog. Then, accept the first sponsorship. This should give you enough cash to buy Midnight Motorist. Every day, you will be given 10 play tokens to spend at various arcade games. Each of these games will give you a score that is added to your FAS rating upon completion. Midnight Motorist is one of the cheapest arcade machines, but is also extremely consistent in getting a good score. It will consistently award you $200 to $300 per play. It also has one of the most fire soundtracks in gaming history. We're going to play Midnight Motorist and continue to buy things from the catalog until we spent $1,000 in total. This will unlock the Smiles and Servos Inc. catalog, but more importantly, the single best arcade cabinet for farming cash. Once you've made $550 from Midnight Motorist and have Smiles and Servos unlocked, purchase the Carnival Hoops arcade cabinet. This game awards 5,000 FAS rating on each play if done properly. It can seem difficult at first, but with this strategy, you'll win most of the time. Normally, the hardest part of the minigame would be making the first shot, as from that point onward, it's essentially just a rhythm game. Dude, oh my god, I'm gonna start raging. Mother f oh my god! However, there's a consistent way to always guarantee that the first shot makes it. Simply hold down spacebar as the get ready text is on screen and help you should get a point before the timer even starts. This gives you a bit of leeway to line up the first shot, then just keep the rhythm and you should easily score 20 or above. This is the best method for cash farming that we have. Now we can work towards the achievements. You obtain these achievements through placing down different sets of animatronics throughout the game. But to do this, you'll need 5 stage spaces. You can get these stage spaces by first upgrading your floor plan to max, then buying the deluxe concert stage and the additional side stage. Now, you should be able to get the trash in the gang achievement by placing them all down, awarding $1,000. This should give you enough money to buy all of the mediocre melodies aside from Orville Elephant. You'll need to unlock the rare finds auction to purchase. 
play through the nights to get more tokens and farm until you can purchase Orville. Also, make sure to add as many coin slots as you can on other items. It'll give you some bonus revenue at the end of the nights. Once you can purchase Orville, place him down with the rest of the mediocre melodies to get $10,000. With this 10k, you can buy all of the Rockstar animatronics and Lefty to then get $20,000, which should be enough for whatever you need for the rest of the playthrough. The last achievement, Funtime and Frenzy, doesn't actually award any money, unfortunately. You could still get it if you want to unlock the, uh, the, uh, the, the pickles, but it doesn't provide any benefits outside of just, I don't know, being there. Now that we know how to cash farm, let's do a quick speed round on how to get every single ending within FNAF 6. We'll go from easiest to hardest. The mediocrity ending is stupid easy to get. The only condition for this ending is to beat the game while your faz rating is at zero. Use your only $100 to buy the sanitation station. Don't worry, it doesn't increase faz rating. Then just breeze through the game. Reject every salvage and don't purchase anything. The bankruptcy ending comes in at our second easiest, with the only condition being to, well, go bankrupt. We're going to farm for this ending, as it isn't always guaranteed, but it's usually faster to just restart save than playing the game out further. Start up your game and buy the discount ball pit, show stage, and Mr. Hugs. This will net you five total risk. Then, start up and breeze through the office section. At the end of every night, you have three possible chances of getting a lawsuit, with a risk and 50 chance each. This means that a lawsuit isn't always guaranteed, but it only took you like five minutes to get here, so just restart the game if you don't get one and try again. Once you do get a lawsuit, just run out of money by settling and you should go bankrupt. Oh! I went bankrupt. You gave it your best shot. I you did. went all in. I really you did. The insanity ending is also pretty simple to get. Use the cash farming strategy until you have enough money for the egg baby data archive. You must purchase it, but you don't have to actually place it down. Then enter into office mode. You'll notice the computer button is now blue. Turn off the computer, hold left click on the power button, then turn the computer back on. You know you've done it once you see schematics for the scooper. Then just let the cutscene play out and you should get your ending. Congratulations! You went somewhere you weren't supposed to go, saw something you weren't supposed to see, and prevented a tidy resolution Same to guy. a messy hey, from somewhere, sir? Before you go, this is a bit of insanity. The lore keeper ending can be a step up from the three previous endings in difficulty. First, you'll need to farm up enough cash to purchase the three lore-based arcade games, Fruity Maze, Midnight Motorist, and the Security Puppet. To unlock the lore secret in Midnight Motorist, wait until the fourth lap and ride near the bottom edge of the screen. You may want to intentionally crash to lose a bit of speed, then go through the road when it opens up on the bottom. <laughs> Make your way to the house and bang on the door. Run back to the hallway and bang on the door again, then go back outside and examine the footprints. This should end the minigame. Now it's time for the second minigame, Fruity Maze. And my god, f*** this minigame. Oh my god! Oh, oh get f***ed! Ah. Uh, all we have to do is beat it two times, but I don't know if it was just me, but this minigame is hard as hell and no one ever talks about it. The best strategy that I found is to always stack the power-ups on top of each other and to really keep track of what section of the maze you've already been in. The cape magnet lightning combo will allow you to clear an entire side, so with enough memory and trial and error, you should be able to beat it twice. Also, make sure to not run past the walls. God, dude. After you beat the minigame twice, just let time run out and you'll have met the condition for the lore keeper ending. Thankfully, the third minigame, Security Puppet, is extremely easy. Just farm up enough cash to purchase it, then playtest it three times. Nothing will happen until the fourth time in which you'll have to walk outside and crawl next to Charlie. This will award you with a good bit of money and meet the last condition for the lore keeper ending. Now just complete Saturday, no salvage is necessary, and just finish the game. Seriously though, fuck Fruity Maze. The completion ending is obtained by beating the game when salvaging all four animatronics. This will make Saturday pretty hard, and I'll cover the strategy for the really hard nights in a bit when we talk about the hardest Saturday. But for now, just know that the only thing you need to worry about is salvaging every single animatronic. Everything else is irrelevant. I would still advise buying the sanitation station though to ensure you don't get any lawsuits. The blacklisted ending is probably the hardest out of the six to obtain. The only condition for this ending is finishing the game with 50 risk or more. Like the bankruptcy the ending, 
this ending also isn't guaranteed, with around a 50% success rate per playthrough. I was lucky enough to get it on my first try, but that won't always happen. The reason for this is because of how the markdown system works. The main way of increasing risk in your pizzeria is to buy marked down items that have risk. Starting on Tuesday, five random items in the catalog will be marked down every single day. The general strategy for this ending is to search through the catalog every single day and buy items that are both marked down and have risk. You don't want to purchase any unnecessary items, as those items could still be marked down in the future and get you more risk. With that said, there's still a bit more planning that needs to be done. When starting out on Monday, buy the discount ball pit and Mr. Hooks. These items cannot be marked down and will give you one risk each. You're going to want to farm up as much cash as possible on Monday in order to unlock as many of the items in the catalog as you can, as markdowns can still go on items that aren't available to you yet. Then, simply search through the catalog every day and acquire as many items as possible that are both marked down and have risk. You can salvage any of the animatronics if you want, as they have a pretty high chance of getting in regardless, but make sure that you buy or salvage Lefty at some point. He has the highest risk value in the game, and that will be key in getting this ending. Make sure not to place down all of the risky items that you've been collecting until Saturday, as you don't want any lawsuits throughout the week. Once Saturday rolls around, buy any remaining items left in the catalog that still have risk, and upgrade your floor plan to max. Place everything down and hope that you got lucky enough to have 50 or higher risk. Then, just finish out Saturday in the office and you'll now have certificates for all six endings. But even with all of the six endings obtained, there still remains one final challenge. As I said earlier, we still have to complete the hardest Saturday, which is Saturday with all salvages, all adds, no tools, and no upgrades. The reason that I didn't cover the office strategy in the actual office section is because the normal strategy and the strategy for the hardest Saturday are almost identical. The only exception being that you'll probably have less adds on a normal playthrough, and you'll be able to have silent ventilation on for some extra cooling. Even with tools, we still wouldn't use the motion detector or audio layer, as they provide no strategical advantage over just listening for movement, especially compared to silent ventilation, which can slow down the temperature even while the terminal is off. But assuming you're going for the hardest Saturday, here's how to go about it. The moment the night starts, go straight for an advertising task. We're going to gamble on the first advertising task being done before the animatronics get to your office. Always stare at a vent until the task is complete, as you don't want to look at the monitor and get any ads. The moment a task finishes, turn off your terminal and fan and wait until you see the grayed out icons on both on the bottom left corner. You won't actually get the super-powered flashlight until these gray buttons appear. While all this is going on, you should be listening for any vent noises, and immediately turning to that side to ward off whatever threats may be in the vents. Savage, shut your bitch ass up too, ho. Taco shell head ass, you ugly as fuck. <laughs> Once both your terminal and fan are fully off, turn to whatever side you last heard vent noises on and hold for 4 seconds. This will make sure that every single threat within that vent is gone before you turn around. If you hear a loud vent sound behind you while waiting on these 4 seconds, feel free to turn around and gamble that whatever animatronic was in the vent in front of you had already left, to prevent getting jump scared from behind. Once you've spent 8 full seconds with both the terminal and fan off, and you've warded off all the animatronics in both of your vents, turn both the terminal and fan back on and immediately start another task. Then, repeat this cycle for the entire night. This is a pretty simple strategy, but there were some common mistakes that I had originally made that I needed to correct in order to beat the night. First, you always want to synchronize the fan and the terminal. Always have them both off and on at the same time. When you warn off animatronics with the super flashlight, they'll be so far away from your office that you can use that time to both cool down the office and get a task done. Your noise level won't matter at this point, as animatronics hearing you isn't a factor in their movement until they're in your adjacent vents. Another mistake I made was playing way Way too patient. At first, I would clear both vents with the super flashlight and wait until I didn't hear any vent noises for 8 full seconds. Animatronics make vent noises when they leave the vents as well, so this strategy led to me starting tasks when the animatronics were already halfway to my office, if not already in the vents. It also made the nights really long. On two of my worst fails, nights lasted 13 to 14 whole minutes. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's my like bitch water, ugly bitch. <laughs> Hey, hey, he's mad because I'm killing him every time. He keep going to the same fucking spot. Man, shut your crap, baby ass up. You ugly ass, like my personal weight trainer, fat head ass, you ugly as shit, bitch.
This knight is most similar to FNAF 3 out of all the different max modes, as there are some situations where the game just decides you lose. The biggest challenge for me personally in this max mode was how long knights took. Without a fixed knight time, knights could be anywhere from 8 to 15 minutes depending on how fast the animatronics decided to move. But with enough patience, you should be able to complete FNAF 6 hardest challenge, the hardest Saturday. Yes! Ah! Let's go! Ah! 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 Yes! Now, this would normally be the part where I would make a montage of my personal completion for this max mode, but to be honest, without sound, this mode is like really boring to watch. So instead, I'm going to do something that has been requested in the comments quite a bit. I haven't played Ultimate Custom Night yet, but now that I've completed FNAF 1 through 6's hardest challenges, I will rank the max modes in all of the FNAF games by difficulty. By far the easiest of the 6 is FNAF 1. I beat this max mode first try, it's extremely easy and extremely consistent. The only somewhat difficult part of the night is that night time of 8 minutes and 55 seconds. But other than that, it is by far, I think, the easiest. For the second easiest, I would have to say FNAF 6. This game has one of the easiest max mode strategies to implement gameplay wise but requires a good deal of patience and some really good hearing. Other than that, it's pretty easy. Coming in at number 4, I have FNAF 4's Blind Mode Mad Freddy Insta Foxy. This spot was a huge toss up between FNAF 4 and FNAF 3, but I ultimately chose FNAF 4 because of consistency. FNAF 4 is much more technically precise than FNAF 3, but has significantly less luck involved outside of Nightmare's laughs. Most of the gameplay just comes down to your own skill. Coming in at our third hardest, I argue that FNAF 3's aggressive nightmare is harder than FNAF 4 because of the RNG nightmare that Springtrap becomes in this game mode. No FNAF 3 isn't that technically demanding, it is far less consistent than all of the games that came before it, which is why I'm giving it this spot. For number 1, I genuinely could not decide between FNAF Sister Location's Golden Freddy and FNAF 2's 1020, so I decided to ask my Discord server that you should most definitely join. The overall debate came down to whether or not you consider RNG to be part of the difficulty factor. FNAF 2 is much easier to technically master than Sister Location, but is much more reliant on luck, whereas Sister Location is much more difficult to learn, but once learned is much more consistent. The community ultimately decided on FNAF 2 as harder, so here is my final pre-Ultimate Custom Night difficulty tier list. Thank you all so much for watching. I know this video has been highly requested, and I'm happy that I could finally, you know, get it done. I wanted to give some credit in this outro to It's Taken and Brayden. It's Taken's original video and Reddit posts on FNAF 6's AI really helped me to understand this game a lot more and formulate the guide and strategy for it. And Brayden helped me understand a lot more of the specifics within the actual code of the game. If you're wondering when I'll make the Ultimate Custom Night video, 100k subs. 100k subs and you will have it. Reason being, I think I need to be a bigger channel to do the actual game justice, but I promise if we hit that 100k goal, I will make the best video to ever exist on YouTube, period. So if you want to see Ultimate Custom Night, be sure to sub, sub to the channel, and until then I'll be posting some more variety game challenges and some fan games, some FNAF fan games probably, so look forward to that. With that said, thank you for watching, peace.